Like, yeah, where is it? <laughs> it's in my safe. I don't like people repeating things all over the place. Uh, and you're right. And I'm bad. Right. Recording in progress. She's like, I don't want to hear it. I don't no, like no. this, man. Huh? Welcome to our world. Huh? I don't like this. I'm going to tell you what. You're setting yourself up for shit. You Nobody think that if somebody else is wearing a mirror, you don't think that's going to happen to Why? 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 Chair of Finance, yes, handle it. It's easy to have a Handle it. Okay, are we ready to go? Okay, you guys. Put them in your car.
holding us outside. I'm not taking mine at all. I'm going to give mine away. I cooked. I forgot. Recording stop. Recording in progress. Are you going? Are we ready? We're ready? Want to call this meeting to order? Thank you guys all for being here. We appreciate everybody in the house. First order of business is a determination of a quorum. Could you please call the roll? Councillor Denise Benavides. Present. Councillor Dennis Tim Salazar. Present. Councillor Dorothy Valdez. Mayor Pro Tem Peggy Sue Martinez. Present, an honor to be here with you all. Uh, we do have a quorum. Uh, the agenda is before you. Do I hear any motions for approval of the agenda? A motion to approve. I'll second the motion. Thank you, Councillor Dennis Tim. Uh, just for purposes of, of there being the fetal pie dinner for the shop with the cop tonight, I don't know if everybody's aware of that or not aware of it. I just feel like it's important to allow the staff an opportunity to go spend some time over there and do what what, what that whole fundraiser is intended for. And it, it is a worthy situation because it is benefiting some of the most needy kids in our community. So we definitely appreciate what's happening there. So I was thinking uh, instead of going through all department reports, if we could just get, um, if we could just get things that are of concern or things that are coming up immediately talked about. And then if the members have any uh, questions concerning anything on the report, they can email you or call you and find out more information about it. If the, if the committee is okay with that, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to do that. I think it's a good idea, Chair. Uh, Council. Madam Chair, um, I'm fine with that. That's, that's absolutely fine. Definitely uh, for them to give the opportunity to attend. Thank you so much, Councillor Dennis Tim Salazar. Okay, so uh, we have a motion and a second for approval of agenda. I'll uh, call for a roll call vote, please. Councillor Denise Benavides. In favor. Councillor Dennis Tim Salazar. For the motion. Mayor Pro Tem Peggy Sue Martinez. I'm also in favor, thank you. Under public comment, do we have people signed up for public comment? Cynthia Lentini. Lentini or Lentini? Lentini. Good evening, Cynthia. How are Good you? Good evening. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm going to make this short and sweet. Uh, there's just some real concerns that I have. Like, I live on the west side on South Coronado Avenue. Yes, west side all the way. And I'm really saddened by the fact that Dee Dee's beef jerky was broken into and that the jerky was taken. But it's not just Dee Dee's. That whole uh, street there, that whole group there, they've all been hit at least once. I have a friend who lives there. This is his third break-in this week. It's only Wednesday. We're, we're experiencing a lot of this on the west side. Um, we see a lot. I, I've seen personally a lot, a significant amount of foot traffic the west side which i didn't see a year ago um, so that's kind of concerning because these are faces that i'm not familiar with and i know that we've been working on the pan the ordinance the solicitation ordinance and i've noticed that since we put that into effect the traffic that's coming through in the residential area has increased and the petty crime seems to be increasing so i would just love to know how we're tackling that and how we're going to address that as a city and then the last thing i'd like to do is um, in this meeting, invite um, the chief, uh, to, both chiefs, since they're both here, to participate with our community-based programs coalitions that are working on the prevention efforts to try to keep our, our youth from substance abuse, but also because we're working on some plans on how to help our adults who are experiencing um, suffering because of substance abuse, including 
maybe providing some kind of support program for those in recovery so that we can get them gainfully employed and keep them in recovery. Because unfortunately, after their recovery period ends and they've detoxed, we're kind of leaving them to twist in the wind, which is increasing our homelessness, it's increasing the petty crime, and it's forcing them back into a lifestyle that they're trying to get out of. So that's what I would like um, this committee to address. Can you give me a little bit of information on when th those meetings are? Yes, ma'am. They are the um, third Thursday of every month. And the work group is called Connecting Our Voices. And Say that again. The work group is called Connecting Our Voices. And we are currently partnering with um, several community-based partners, including the Rio Reba Sheriff's Office. So it would, for, for our group and everyone who's a member, the information that the Chief of Police, our Student Resource Officer, and our Fire Chief and Deputy Chief can provide us has so much value that we know that we can work on getting additional funds into our community to provide that grant support for our, our members, our community members. So I would really like some consideration and participation from the city on that. What time are the meetings? And what they are from 2 to 4 p.m. on the third Thursday of every month. Where at? Um, they're normally at the Lanel Foundation office, and when they're not there, they're at the Heritage office. Uh, we do have an email um, group that we can add um, as many members as you'd like to, for me to add to that so that you can be notified every month. If you could please forward th that information to all committee members. Yes, ma'am. And also to uh, Chief Martinez and to Chief Garcia. Can do. Thank you so much. Thank you Appreciate so much. You. Yes, Thank you for your time. I, I too have seen a, a, an increase of theft on the west side, an increase of homeless people on the west side, an increase of walking traffic on the west side. And uh, I, I would like to hear from the chief a little bit about how the department is thinking of shifting some of the focus to where that's happening. Uh, but I'll wait for, for that deal. So we are still under public comments. Who, who else do we have? Bethany Bratley. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so, oops, wow, I'm really loud, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so a few weeks ago, somebody was selling puppies at Walmart and I tried my hardest not to take any of them even though I wanted them. The temperature was 30 degrees. These were little blue healer puppies who were barely six weeks old, not even old enough to should be legally or not. Um, this is becoming a big issue. My husband walks to work. Um, he works at Denny's in that empty parking lot that's right next to Denny's. There's the same vehicle every time with their back end popped open with puppies repeatedly being given away in a parking lot. Honestly, if I had my own house, I would have my own rescue at this point because we need it. Espanola Humane is overrun. They're trying their hardest. As you saw, they even had to transport puppies to another state. Um, there is free spay neuter offered. Um, as a matter of fact, the woman who pays for that is one of our clients out in Santa Fe. She's a very good friend of mine. She's an amazing woman. She literally funds every spay, neuter, microchip, and vaccine that comes out of that clinic herself. Now, it bothers me beyond belief, and I think that there needs to be something done. Uh, I found multiple animals the other day on my way to work who were hit by cars because people let their animals roam these streets. Um, my neighbor's dog was attacked as she was putting her dog in the car because we have dogs running the streets. Um, this is so out of control. It's, it's, you know, everybody talks about feral cats, but what about these dogs that are roaming the streets here? You know, and they do it mostly on weekends again when we don't have animal control. 
and the police obviously don't can't go and pick them up or say they won't when I call. I'm not putting some stray dog in my vehicle as much as I love animals, but I don't have time to try and trap or chase a dog across the street. And I'm s blocking the middle of Riverside as dogs are crossing so people don't whip around me and hit another dog because I'm tired of picking them up off the road and taking them to my job to take care of them in the machine that I, I run. That's it's, it's not just that, and there was a fire in my trailer park, and now there's a whole bunch of squatters going on there, and they're trying to get this trailer moved, but it's become difficult. And my whole trailer park has become overrun with homeless and junkies sitting across, shooting up, and by the time the police arrive, they're done, or you know, one of them is a very well-known junkie, apparently, in our area. And the police pulled up, and he said, well, what do you want me to do? Well, tell him he's got to go somewhere else. He doesn't live here, but his friend lives here. But he doesn't. So, you know, it's getting unsafe. I almost got uh, jacked up at Walmart. If I didn't have my stun gun, something probably would have happened. For your comments. Anyone else? Ephraim Hernandez. Oh. Um, thank you, honorable city council members, staff your time and attention today. I would like to extend an appreciation to our city's law enforcement for clocking in each day uh, and our fire department as well as, as the intention to serve and protect the public is assumed in doing so. Um, I think it's safe to say that Española residents feel less safe than before the anti-panhandling ordinance was passed. Passing the ordinance has succeeded temporarily in removing the homeless from view on street medians, but has increased the amount of homeless people approaching the public in parking lots, and as you've heard, other areas in town. The ordinance has also made the homeless feel more insecure and less safe as well. Um, I'm going to talk about the Bible, so if there's anybody here who might get offended by that, you may want to plug your ears now. The Bible speaks of almsgiving. Almsgiving is the Bible's equivalent to panhandling. Someone in need sits or stands in a public forum requesting alms. Giving alms is a righteous act because the Bible states in the book of Deuteronomy, there will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow fellows who are poor and needy in your land. Or in the book of Proverbs 9.17, whoever cares for the poor lends to the Lord who will pay back the sum in full. All, of the scripture, all over the scripture, God teaches humanity how important it is to him to care for the needy, the destitute, and the poor. Since the ordinance is passing, the homeless have had to resort to other risky means to obtain what they need. The ordinance is a clear violation of their First Amendment rights and has obstructed and restricted the only just, legal, and biblical avenue for obtaining alms from the public. I am now asking the council today to reverse your decision, now before the ACLU br brings a lawsuit against our city that will cost more in the long run. I recommend, if possible, the mayor or any of the city councilors move to reverse the anti-panhandling ordinance immediately. The same thing happened in 2019, wherein the city of Albuquerque lost a lawsuit against a similar anti-panhandling ordinance. I also recommend the city consider offering the homeless the opportunity to work. If the city is willing to consider a program where homeless people can earn money by, say, cleaning up trash around the city, give them orange vests, organize the use of a van or a bus, and a meeting place a couple of times a week, designate someone to supervise where, there, and there you go. I'd also like to extend my uh, appreciation to Councilor Benavides for working, uh, cooperating with me in putting together a crisis team for the city from the uh, Santa Clara apartments that are in the hotels that I'm working with also. Um, I have one gentleman here today from there who's, who's, who's listening to find out more about the situation. 
Uh, many of them are still concerned about getting their belongings. Um, they don't feel safe. Uh, so um, I just wanted to quickly mention that. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, sir. Anybody else? Did you want an opportunity to speak, sir? I'm just giving everybody a quick uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, that being said, I guess we're done with the public comments. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and allow for committee member comments at this time. Uh, Councilor Dennis, are you there? Um, yes, ma'am, thank, thank you, uh, Madam Pro Tem. Um, I appreciate that opportunity. Um, yeah, and speaking uh, as mentioned prior about the uh, uptick in crime on the west side of town, as well as the uh, added traffic, I have noticed that as you know, we all know that um, Councillor uh, Peggy Sue, I mean Mayor Putin Peggy Sue and myself, um, along with uh, Councillor Salazar and uh, uh, Mayor John Ramon, live on the west side, so. With that stated, and I'm sure we've all observed that as well as part of the governing body. So um, I would just you know, like to know as well as to what um, Madam Pro Tem uh, Martinez did state as far as, you know, just an update from our chief of police as to kind of exactly what is going on and reasons for this uh, uptick in traffic and of course uh, the crime regarding the break ins and so on. So uh, so just with that, I just you know like to get an update on that. And uh, that's about all I have right now. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Absolutely, thank you, sir. Councilor Denise Benavides. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just in reference to that, I know that I'm staying really in close contact with all the individuals from District 3. We've had two meetings so far and we're planning another meeting. And it seems as though maybe the crime and some of the homeless have moved to this side of town because they're not seeing it on that side of town now. So um, there is still some cleanup, I think, that uh, needs to happen in reference to a lot of areas that need cleanup actually because I think you know that'll help um, I know that I did contact chief about um, a tent city uh, behind uh, Washington Federal although I don't know if they're they're gone or not I know the paper contacted me today chief about a tent city that uh, Representative Montoya sent me an email about um, So I'll have to get that to you. I didn't have a chance to get that to you today um, in reference to, I'll talk a little bit about Santa Clara Apartments just briefly, because I know we're pressed for time and everybody wants to get to the Frito Pie dinner. Um, and, and I'll talk more about that at council next week. Um, of the individuals that are left uh, at the hotels currently today and the children there, um, we're doing our best to be able to work with each and every one of them that has requested assistance, because some of them have not. Um, we are in process. I did find some apartment complexes off of uh, Airport Road today. Uh, we did get one individual into an apartment in Santa Fe today. Um, there's a lot that um, miscommunication that happened between USDA and the tenants and the city actually. And so um, I'm rectifying that situation as best that we can to move us forward. Um, I'm seriously concerned about some of the females with little kids living in cars currently. It's a huge concern for me and I'm moving forward to also assist the seniors as best that we can. Um, there are some that wanna move to Santa Fe, there are some that do not. Um, and we're just doing what we can to assist and to work together with those that have uh, requested that assistance. So, thank you, Chair. Thank you for for all your concern with uh, District 3 and especially with uh, some of the most needy in our community and dealing with the situation at hand with Santa Clara Apartments, I, I feel like uh, all departments involved, fire department, police department, uh, the city managers, everybody looked at that situation with a different, from a different view. And uh, I really believe that you stepped up to the plate in a way that was very necessary at the time. So I can't thank you enough for doing that. And I really appreciate you helping those people. Thank you. Uh, matters from the chair, uh, the things, the things that I have, uh, you know, I, I need a, I need an update on the traffic control. If anybody has made contact with um, 
the Espanola Public Schools concerning the comments that were made at the last meeting with the backup of traffic at JHR at, at prime time, three o'clock, it's, it's a mess. And then the other one is uh, Camino Arbolera uh, in front of McCurdy School and also uh, South McCurdy dealing with that backup over there. And McCurdy just needs to figure out a better plan for their pickup because they're, they're actually uh, choking off that, that uh, road. So I just want an update on whether or not we've dealt with the Espanol Public Schools on that or whatever. And then I, I would like an update on the community policing. Where are we at with that? Have we developed, um, have we worked on policies or developed policies for uh, becoming real neighborhood watches, like uh, sanctioned neighborhood watches, nationally recognized neighborhood watches where we have communities like Camino Santa Cruz that has already showed some grave interest in trying to develop a community policing situation there. I know here on the west side, we feel the same. And, and as you said, and as everybody has mentioned, there has been an uptick in crime on the west side. Um, the robbery, of course, as everybody learned about through television. And not only the robbery, but people that have been broken into, not once, but some, some places have even been broken into twice. So there's a big concern with that also. Uh, concerning, <coughs> uh, the other thing I want to discuss a little bit, and, and maybe not at this meeting, but in the future, I would like to know about uh, what we've done with GPSing our, our vehicles for the city uh, to maintain that our, our, uh, our staff is utilizing the vehicles in the safest ways possible, uh, maintaining their speed and speed zones and other things like that. So I, I want to look at that down the road also. But for right now, I really felt that it was important that the committee members understand what's happening with the recent rash of fires that the fire department has had to deal with. Uh, I think within a 10 day period, they did three different house fires and a couple of those were, one of them was in the early morning, Saturday morning, and the other two were in the middle of the night. So it's been a little taxing for the department, but more than that, it has left, it has left uh, buildings in our community that are unsafe and half burned and half thrown and not really dealt, dealt with as of yet. So I wanted to give Ms. Lou Baker from the planning department and the uh, zoning code enforcement department an opportunity to just uh, fill the committee members with how they're handling the different structures that have already burned. Thank you, Ms. Baker, for attending. We appreciate your time here and we appreciate you addressing this situation. Thank you very much, um, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, Councilor Benavides. Uh, Councilor Dennis Salazar, I really appreciate your uh, time tonight. Thank you for inviting me to make a presentation. Um, this Bless you. Bless you. The work that we do here at the city is not done by one person. The work is done by a team. I work very closely with Mr. Mondo Rodriguez. I work very closely with Mr. Vince Baldonado and I work very closely with Mr. Robert Frisch. I also um, very dependent on Mr. John Wickersham at the fire department, Mr. Uh, Chief Johnny Martinez and Chief Mizell Garcia and his team, their teams. So this is not um, something that just happens uh, by, uh, in, a, in a vacuum. So we have a significant number of nuisance properties in the city and I know you invited me to, to talk about some burn properties and I will bring those up here. So the very first one that I wanna talk about is at 502, excuse me, 520 South Monterey. This property is owned by Miss Lynn Gould. The property, uh, as you can see, is a nuisance property. It was a magnet for homelessness and drug uh, use. It's right behind the former uh, 31 Flavors restaurant it's, it, there's currently a paleta bar there. If you look at the bottom right-hand corner, that's where we are right now. It has been demoed. Uh, we're down to the floor of the trailer and that eventually will be moved out. And what I mean eventually with, is within the next 14 days. Uh, everything is uh, time sensitive, but also we work with these property owners um, 
in a, in a manner that allows them the time that they need. And, they, and as long as we're communicating, and I'll, and I'll share another property with you, as long as we're communicating, I'm willing to work with them. Next slide, please. This one here is Fairview Lane. Uh, this uh, piece of property had a metal building on it. It was uh, a significant magnet for homelessness and drug use. Uh, there is a lot of, thank you, um, a lot of par paraphernalia, hypodermic needles on the property. The building has been raised. Uh, Mr. John Rayburn is the owner. He recently passed away on November the 20th. I am working with the uh, family to, um, they want to put this piece of property on the market. The city currently has a lien, a clean and lien on that property for $53,000. Uh, so I will be working with them to make sure that we get that taxpayer money back into the coffers. I guess I have to be smarter than the average bear here. So hold on, sorry. I don't know what I did, Miss Emma. Okay, okay, so uh, is it the bottom button? <laughs> One on the right, okay, so let me try this. Hey. Okay, sorry, I should have practiced. <laughs> this one here was a real nuisance property and it was extremely difficult working with the property owner. This piece of property is on the, co on the corner of Cayo del Rio and Rivers, um, Railroad Avenue. This is what it looked like and uh, it was, it, uh, I need to really give a shout out to Mr. Armando Rodriguez because he worked uh, very hard with this property owner. We are at the point where you see on the bottom right hand corner, the, the structure has been uh, thrown down. Uh, now we are in the phase of just having them clean up. I am very um, thorough about where they um, d dispose of this material. I do not want this material placed in an arroyo out in the county or somewhere. They need to come back and present to the city a manifest that it's been uh, deposited or dip disposed of in, at Los Alamos County or Santa Fe County or at a, at a legal transfer station. This was a, a, an extremely nuisance property. Uh, the property was boarded up. Uh, within a week, trucks were driving up and actually pulling the plywood off the windows and driving off with the plywood. Okay, so let's see, I, we already saw that one. This one here is 612 Fairview Lane. There is a gentleman that lives there. He is a special needs gentleman. The building uh, has been uh, boarded up. He has found his way back in there. I'm trying to work with him um, every day, go out to visit with him. We, it just It's a dilemma. I don't know how to get him out. Um, we've, Mr. Uh, Mayor, um, John Ramon Vigil and I have visit with him, offered him an opportunity to come and work in the park, clean the park, what, what we need to do. Uh, so we're working with this gentleman <coughs> on a daily basis. Uh, yes. Speaker, have, have you contacted like Habitat at all, Habitat for Humanity or any organizations that could possibly lend a hand in rehabbing one of these houses? That, uh, no, I have not. I will do that, thank you. Madam Mayor Pro Ten, my last 40 days have been consumed by the Santa Clara apartments, but we'll get to that in a few minutes, okay? Um, so here we are at 125 North Railroad Avenue. This is the property that's immediately north of the Rio Grande Sun. This was a nuisance property for some time. They, they threw down two uh, residential structures and they left the debris there. So uh, I worked very closely with the property owner, Ms. Kelly Armstrong, and her project manager, Mr. Lucas Corvada, Mr. Lucas Cordova, excuse me. And uh, we are almost to the end of this project. They're gonna clean it out. They wanna meet with me and staff to possibly uh, come up with a plan on how to develop that land. They're looking at possibly some housing, um, maybe some storage units, uh, I don't know what, what their plan is, but I will um, let you know when, that, uh, when we have that meeting. 206 North Railroad Avenue, this was a, a real magnet for crime, homelessness, drug use. This property is owned by Dr. Anthony Garcia at the Inn at the Delta. 
Um, Mr. Garcia was a pleasure to work with, just amazing. Uh, the property was condemned, boarded up, and within a week, this bottom right hand, this bottom left hand corner, there is no more structure. He made that happen. So I'm really, really impressed with Dr. Garcia. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. 300 Railroad Avenue, there's a structure fire here. The property owner is Yvette Martinez. Um, the city has offered to purchase the property. It abuts directly east of the Valdez Park. Uh, the city will most likely close on this piece of property within the next week uh, with Ms. Martinez and then the building, the structure itself will be raised. And uh, what I mean by this is that in an effort to um, conserve funds, because I'm on a real tight budget, the planning department is on a very, very tight budget, uh, we decided to do this in-house. So if the city buys the property, then city staff can demo the building and we can um, um, rent or um, lease the 40-yard dumpsters and have everything removed and clear that piece of property up. If it goes out to a private contractor, we're looking at about $32,000 to have that building removed. Up the street from the 300, prop, 300 Railroad Avenue, we're gonna go up two lots north, and, uh, and this, is, this property is owned by Ms. Yvonne Quintana. The property, the, the scene or the photo that's on the left was something that we dealt with for about a, about two weeks, there was no fence around it, and I constantly saw children in there. I don't know if they were from the neighborhood or from the park. I reached out to Ms. Quintana, I asked her to please fence the property. Uh, we met, I asked her that this needs to be, get cleaned up in 14 days. There was something going on in the family, she asked for an extension. The drop dead date to have this piece of property cleaned up, and if it's not done by January the 28th, the city will go in and clean it up and lean the property. It, it is currently fenced though, correct? That is, it's currently fenced, yes. And you haven't seen any children in there since? That's correct, no children have been in there. 1316 A and B Lomita Lane. These are two double wide mobile homes on one lot. Uh, they are, uh, Mr. Armando Rodriguez does a drive-by every day. We have a very good uh, relationship with Ms. Marcy Davis, the, the neighbor in the Adobe house on the backside. She lets us know what's going on as, as soon as anyone drives up into that piece of property. One of the things that you'll notice, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, is that when we're working with um, trailers, double wides, single wides, is that even if we board them up and we secure them, um, individuals will breach the structure by going underneath the floor. And that's one of the things that I kept seeing here in Calle de Rio is um, after a public hearing, or if I was working late and on my way home, I kept seeing lights inside that structure. And I'm like, well, the building's boarded up. What are they doing? So they're, they're get, they get into these structures through the floor. And we have another piece of property on Star Lane where they're doing that. Um, you can actually see condensation on the windows uh, uh, because there are people inside. 919 Pacheco Lane, I failed to get a photo of this. This is off of State Road 76 in Pacheco Lane. The property owner is Ms. Lupe Salazar. I've been working with her um, just to uh, develop trust with her, let her know that I'm, I'm willing to work with her in any way that needs to, uh, I was able to uh, get her some documentation from the county. She really didn't even know who owned the property. Uh, was it her dad's? What did she, um, did it go to her when her father passed away? That kind of stuff. So there's some things that she needs to get resolved in probate so that we can move forward. And, uh, but she has worked with Armando. The place is cleaned up. The weeds are cut. And uh, the majority of the trash, a lot of the trash has been hauled off. This is what Santa Clara Apartments, there are 48 units in Santa Clara Apartments. Of the 48 units, I, I spent 
from November the 9th till yesterday, every day at Santa Clara Apartments. I know the building inside and out. I know the families. I know Mr. Matthew Rabatoy. I know these families. I've spent time with them. But this is what the majority of the apartments look like. Who failed these families is not the city. I stress the city had nothing to do with what happened at the Santa Clara Apartments. What happened at the Santa Clara Apartments is the result of the property owner, the result of the property manager, and the result of the USDA not conducting their inspections to ensure that these families live in a safe, healthy environment. This is where someone lived on a day-to-day. -day. They, uh, every single apartment looks like this, and the smell. I, I, I wish we could have smell of vision so I could let you know what it smells like. Terrible. This is Santa Clara Apartments. Top photo is what it looks like, or what it looked like when I first drove up. Or no, that was not when I first drove up because I think that photo, it, was, it snowed that day. That may be maybe about November the 12th when that photo was taken. The photo below it is what it looked like yesterday. They wrapped it up. We have the building fully secured. Uh, the first floor is double boarded from inside and outside. They went into every apartment and they boarded uh, every window from the inside also. The second floor has been boarded up. The roof and any access to the building on the roof has been boarded up. Um, Individuals that have been breaching this building are creative, extremely creative, and they find any weakness that is there and they get into the building. You'll notice on the left, every single portal in the building has been removed because they would uh, get onto the portal and access the second floor through the windows. The contractor used three inch one-way lugs. You can't remove them, they're impossible to remove. So um, the city with Councilor Benavides help, I wanna uh, shout out to you. You worked every day with these families. The phone calls, I, uh, my phone blew up, just, and I know your phone blew up. Uh, I was out there on Thanksgiving afternoon I was out there Friday after Thanksgiving. I was out the motels on Saturday. We had some issues with some of the tenants at the motels. So um, what's not up here is a fire that um, Mr. Wickersham called me on. It's on East Laguna, right behind the Alsops. Uh, and Armando will be working on that. We'll be working with that family. Uh, the, the building is thrown down. We just need to get it. Uh, all the debris removed off the property. It was an adobe structure. These fires, I'm not a firefighter and I'm not a, a, an investigator, but I'm of the opinion that the majority of these fires have been caused by the homeless that are seeking a place to stay warm. And so uh, I just wanted you to know that we have been working really hard to uh, address these nuisance properties. This is just the surface. I knew that we did not have enough time for me to go into a, all of the properties that we're working on. But I wanna thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. And I, uh, I'm open for any questions. Lou, I just wanna make a couple of comments um, in reference to Santa Clara Apartments. You're right, it has been work like no other work in between work, right? It, yep. it's, you and I had a conversation this morning. Um, I, I do wanna say that when the community was reaching out for the city to do something about this property, and, and I'll tell you, it, it was almost the entire community, right? Uh, there, there was no ill intended to any of the in individuals that lived there. The majority of the individuals that lived there knew and wanted it to be closed because of the conditions that they were living under and what it had become, and because they also knew a lot of the crime that was happening within those walls. Um, where I think the city failed and, and, and is that 
And you and I talked about this. We could have had a better plan. We could have done some things better. Uh, I don't think we knew at the time or grasped uh, the extent, right? And, and uh, it, it's a learning experience for us as we go forward. Um, I try never to go backwards. Uh, all we can do now is try to assist the individuals that we're currently working with. I think that uh, those that were involved that, the, that did the best that they could at the time based on instruction that was given. Um, I do uh, believe that the one thing that really has not been talked about and you brought it up is that I said it at the first meeting uh, to USDA and absolutely they failed because they had an obligation not just to these individuals but to hold that property owner accountable. And this property has been that way for many years so absolutely USDA failed. And, and they continue to fail because you know as well as I do, Lou, on conversations we had this morning, some of the applicants uh, still have not received any type of vouchers. Uh, I, I was not under the understanding that they were gonna have to reapply and requalify. That was not what we were told up front by USDA. Uh, the letters that they provided are helpful, but not everybody has received the letter. Uh, you have and I have placed numerous calls to USDA to try to get these individuals the letters that they require so that we can get them housed if possible. Um, I mean, it's been a ton of work, a ton of work. And, and um, the good news is that I hope there is a light at the end of the rainbow in that some of these individuals that we can help get housed will no longer have to live under the conditions that they were living in because they deserve better than that especially those that, that are seniors. Um, you know, I believe, like I said, we could have done, we could have done better, um, you know, but, but we can't go back. All we can do is try to do what we can to assist, and, and that's what I'm doing. I'm focusing on those individuals that uh, have children living in cars. Those are my first priority. Those are the ones I'm currently working with, and those seniors that are in need uh, of not just supplies, uh, but other, um, assistance they need to try to, to work together with homes. So so we're helping individuals uh, apply for public housing. We're helping individuals apply for vouchers that may be out there through other entities. Uh, we're currently working with LifeLink. We're working with the Empty Stocking Fund. I'm working with St. Vincent and Quorum. You know, when, when you're working with federal funds, nothing happens quickly. So, you know, uh, it just doesn't. That's just the way that it is. But, you know, hopefully we can move forward and, and you know, learn from, from our mistakes and just do what we can to continue to, to help as much as we can. Uh, in my final closing, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, I am currently working on a um, clean and lean for the Santa Clara Apartments. I will be placing a lien on the property close to about $120,000 that the city has spent on that property. So the property will go, now that the property has been condemned, and the families have been moved out. Now the USDA will start the foreclosure process. I spoke with USDA today. They are in the process of hiring an, an appraiser to come out. I will meet with the appraiser and give them access to the building. Uh, currently, um, as of tomorrow, uh, I will be meeting with Matthew tomorrow and giving him access to the building and let him get his personal belongings out. But once that happens, the building will go dark. And so it, in, that in itself is a hazard. So I'm going to be, I will limit access to the building because there are hypodermic needles. It's a very hazardous place and I don't want anyone to get hurt. So when the appraiser does come by, most likely we'll maybe go in with the fire department with lights and stuff like that or whatever. We'll be proactive in that regard. So I just wanted to let you know, and now this $120,000 is just an estimate. That is money that, uh, that will be paid to the contractor for securing the building. This will be money that the city has spent. We're gonna, I'll, I will be quantifying the amount of money that the city has spent on this building in the past for police services, for fire department services. And um, Mr. Jeff Sargent was there on Tuesday night when the building was secured. He was there with Mr. Jerome Hawkins and they, they were, I mean, they really knew what they were doing when we had to secure that building that night. So uh, this is a significant amount of taxpayer money that this one property has taken away from the rest of the community. So thank you very much.
for your presentation on on these properties and thank you for your work in dealing with some of the most difficult uh, property situations that are happening in our community. I uh, I have to say that you know the Santa Clara apartment to me uh, clo closing it was was no was not something the city took e lightly and. I felt very strongly about it at the time, and the reason that I felt strongly about it, it for me it dealt with that building being a fire trap, with numerous fire alarms going off and the people being callous to the fire alarm and not even paying attention to it. And the concern for me dealt with, man, if there was a real fire there at two in the morning, nobody would even get out of bed because they were so used to four or five alarms a day, they, they, they felt that it was a false alarm. So for me, I really felt like that was one of the factors that led me to believe that these people are not safe. And <coughs> like what was, has been said that this situation has taken a, a lot of toll on the staff, it's taken a lot of toll on Councilor Denise, it's taken a lot of toll on a lot of people to have to try and protect these, these individuals. And it's hard to protect individuals that, that don't have uh, uh, help in place to, to, to move on or, or support to, to do what they need to do. So I do agree that we need to figure that out. We need to do better the next time. And uh, I'm just grateful that there, there wasn't a fire there with 20 or 30 or 40 people dying in a, in a fire like that. So I'm grateful for that, that, that that's not a, an issue anymore. And then I'm also grateful that our fire department and our police department are not over there five or six or seven times a day. Um, I'm hopeful that each and every individual that is in need of housing that came away from that building will find solace and find peace and find a home that they feel safe in and protected. I can't imagine living in a, in a building where you don't feel that. So I'm very hopeful that that will happen. Um, like I said, thank you, Ms. Baker, for the work that you're doing. I, I have to give you a lot of credit because I feel like you're dealing with some of the most egregious situations in our community, some of the most difficult things to, to have at task. You know, you're, you're dealing with structures that the city really doesn't want to lose any structures. I don't. I feel like every house is important in this community, and especially adobe houses, they, they're near and dear to my heart. And uh, with the housing shortage and the housing crunch and not having apartments or things available to people that are in need, it, it just breaks my heart to see houses like that double wide that looks like a perfectly good house for a family to live in and no owner to take care of it and nobody to handle it to the situation where it can be utilized in a positive way for a family. So, so those kinds of things, you know, you're doing some of the most difficult work in our community and I cannot thank you enough for your commitment and for what you do. Serious. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely, but, but you know, uh, leadership in your department and, and what you do and how you do it and how you're able to, you know, like you talked about how working with one individual was a lot easier than other individuals, but you know, it takes a special approach when you're dealing with people in their properties. You can't just go over there with an iron thumb and say, this is how I want this done. I think you have to have empathy with people and I think you have had that. You've extended time when you've had to, and you've reached out to them beyond what is even allowable at times. So you know what, I just really appreciate that, and I feel like that's what makes Española different from a lot of communities, is that we do have the heart for people, and we want to help as many people as we can. And the ordinances and the laws are really meant to, to protect the people, you know, uh, so, so thank you again for the work that you're doing and thank you to your staff and please extend 
this committee's thanks to, to everybody. Uh, Councilor Dennis, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I appreciate that. Um, <coughs> I do agree. A lot of it, you know, came down to, to safety reasons. And, it, you know, just going back to the appearance over time, as the safety um, reasons were not being addressed. So uh, in the long run, I, you know, it felt like, you know, this was one of the very few options that it came to, but at the same time, I was just very concerned about the timing. Two days before Thanksgiving, it's just, yeah, you know, that just not sit well with me at all. And then especially for individuals, you know, to be displaced, even more so individuals with disabilities, the elderly, uh, children, and then what about, you know, housing, shelter, food, and I know they, uh, a lot of them have these concerns, and uh, some of them have lived there for years. Uh, as mentioned, too, you know, some of them had no support system, no family, nobody to be able to turn to, uh, no money, no understanding of how they can get out of this. So, yeah, I definitely do know that it has taken a, a, a toll on the residents, but of course, it did take a, a you know, big toll on our police department, our fire department, uh, our planning and zoning, our, you know, city staff who helped to address this issue. And, uh, you know, with that, I, I do feel that this uh, could be utilized as a great learning experience as far as, you know, uh, looking what um, did go right, but of course, what did not go right. And then, of course, these are humans. Nonetheless, these individuals are humans. So, um, so with that stated, I know... <clears throat> Um, there was talk, of course, about, you know, uh, finding them alternate temporary places to, to stay and so on. But um, but just with that stated, it was just like a tough situation all around. I know things are uh, currently, you know, continuing at this time. So um, just as one counselor, I would just like, you know, to be kept in the loop for this because I personally feel I was left in the dark. I did not know a lot of information that I come to find out. Uh, later and it was very it, it was uh, very frustrating very heartbreaking as well and uh, one thing too is I would like to give a huge kudos to Councillor Denise Benavides because I do feel Denise went uh, above and beyond even outside her scope of work as a city councillor you know and then of course uh, with her, her knowledge and individuals that she knows through through housing and then of course um, assisting a lot of these you know individuals that have been left displaced so um that's about all i have to state right now but i do of course want to continue to keep an eye on this and then of course hoping uh, we as a whole can you know possibly help to prevent you know possibly future situations and if other things do come to this uh you know i hope this can be a great learning experience and for us to be able to move forward um that's all i have thanks for uh, for allowing me to speak on this uh mayor pro tem i appreciate that Thank you, Councillor Dennis. I, I think some of the points that you make are very, um, very on point uh, as far as this being a learning experience for all of us. And some of some of uh, some of us didn't have as much information that we would have liked. So definitely, I understand where you're coming from. I'm going to allow Councillor Denise a, a follow up. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. I, I just want everybody to keep in mind that when you see those pictures of Santa Clara apartments, I want all of you to keep in mind that as, as bad as they look to us, uh, these were somebody's home. And, and it was the only home they had. And, and I was as much caught off guard that day as every single tenant was in that building. And I had a conversation with Mayor Pro Tem a few days later and I was mad, was I not Mayor Pro Tem? <laughs> that particular day was probably one of the saddest days I've ever had in my life because I could do nothing but cry with those individuals. There was a room full of them on the phone with me and it was heartbreaking and heart-wrenching and I was mad as heck. And, and that's the only time I cry when I'm mad. And I was mad because at the end of the night, I felt as though we had robbed some of those individuals of their dignity. And, and when that happens, I don't do well with that, and I don't sit well with that. And, and I hope that at some day we have the opportunity to apologize to every single one of those individuals because 
they deserve it and we need to give them that because when they were told that they were going to have additional time to move out i was told the same thing and up until probably an hour before that day at 10 o'clock i was still told that they were going to have a month and that is not what happened and, and I was upset that I was lied to along with them, and I did not take kindly to that. And, and I was fuming, fuming, I'll tell you. And, you know, Mayor Pro Tem did everything she could to offer her assistance. And I said, I don't want your assistance. I don't want Espanola's assistance. I'm going to reach out to my, college from, my colleagues from Santa Fe County. I was just mad, and I was done at that point, right? But, but, <laughs> but we, <laughs> she got some of the rap for Mayor Pro Tem because she happened to call me. But, um, but you know, uh, that being said, we go forward, right? And we do what we can. My fear, as some of you know, that work in this industry, a friend's been helping as much as he can. Uh, my friend Pamela Padaka, several individuals are helping. Um, I, I'm thankful that the, the shelter is open now, six days a week, seven to seven. I just spoke to them today. Uh, I did speak to some homeless individuals the other night and uh, they were on their way there to the shelter. They're offering laundry services, showers, meals. Uh, so I'm thankful for that. Um, the hotel assistance, unfortunately, uh, is only up to 90 days thereafter. Uh, I am fearful that all those people will be out on the street because the lack of housing is just a crisis everywhere, as everyone knows. And so. We have that short window to do what we can to assist those individuals. So, Cynthia, to you uh, and, and the individuals that are, are making up Connect Our Voices, I'd like for us to not work in different avenues. Uh, I'd rather people work together for the same goal because when you have too many people working you know, on different areas or different sections, uh, it makes it that more difficult. And, and I'll tell you right now, we could probably use all the help we can get, right? And so if you would please reach out to me, I'd appreciate it. And, and let's see what we can do going forward to assist the ones that are still in hotels, that still don't have their vouchers, still don't have their LOPE letters, and are still um, in need of some sort of housing. So let's work together uh, going forward and let's see how we, can, how we can come out of this. Thank you, Mayor. Th thank you again, Denise. Uh, Thank you so much for, for the heart that you have and the compassion that you have. Uh, like I said, I feel like that's what makes us when you're a little bit different than most communities is that most people here are very caring and very loving and, and you showed that. And uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes I'm just moved to call a person for no reason whatsoever and that day uh, <laughs> there was a reason, you know? So um, I, I just wanna let you know that I knew that you were crying out of anger and frustration and uh, I just want you to know that I hope you feel supported in in your endeavors with this job and how taxing it can be at times and know that you're not alone Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to approval of the minutes for public safety committee meeting minutes of October 5th 2022 do I hear a motion to approve so moved. move to approve Thank you. Uh, all in favor of approving these minutes signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Uh, motion passes three to zero. Next is uh, public safety meeting minutes of uh, November the 2nd, 2022. Do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Second, sir. Second. Thank you, Councillor Dennis Tim. Uh, all in favor of the Public Safety Committee meetings minutes for November 2nd being approved. Signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion passes three to zero. The next item is item number eight, discussion and recommendations items to full counselor. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chief Misel Garcia, you are on the hot seat, sir. I need to have like a one hour. Uh, recommendation to full council consideration and approval for the purchase of six vehicles for DPS. Uh, 
is that the only purchase requisition you have? Do you have a? No, ma'am, we have several. Um, the purchase requisitions cover the, the vehicles and all the outfitting to the vehicles. And then the additional money that we're gonna have to take out of one of our vehicle accounts, because we were 3,000, I believe $3,500 over the, the capital outlay money that was uh, funded for us. So that 3,500 is coming out of what line item, sir? It's coming out of our 124 account, and the line item is 124-190-48070. Okay. So that's a 124 fund public safety? Yes. Uh, so 3,500 is the only money of the cities that's coming out of that then? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you tell me wh what type of vehicle and how the vehicle was procured or have they been procured, or is this a CES purchase? These these vehicles, ma'am, are 2022 Dodge Durangos. Um, four of the vehicles will be patrol vehicles. One of the vehicles will be a supervisor, and one will be a transport vehicle. So each vehicle in and of itself costs the same amount. We purchased them from a, a vendor with a state contract in Santa Fe. Um, we'll see the breakdown that individually each, each vehicle cost us per unit $37,826. Now, the build equipment, depending on the type of vehicle, changed anywhere from $13,756 up to $17,943 for the four uh, field units. That's completely ready to go. Yep. Lights, That's sirens. Everything radios, electronic for computer, everything, correct? It's ready to hit the road, yes. And painted and everything, correct? Um, everything. Um, the lieutenant vehicle will not be wrapped. The detention vehicle will not be wrapped, but the four patrol vehicles will have the wrapping, yes. And we are staying uniform with the wrapping. We're not doing anything. No, we're not changing anything. We're not doing no, anything. We're going to have the same. Everything's going to be uniform. Yes. And each unit will have a unit number on it, correct? Yes. <sighs> Motion to approve and move on to full council. So moved. Councilor Dennis, do I hear a second? Sorry about that. Second the motion. Thank you. Uh, any any uh, any other questions besides those that I've posed from either of you guys? No, Councilor Dennis. Uh, no, ma'am, not at this time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chief Misel. Thank you for the state of New Mexico for allowing this uh, state money to be utilized for uh, purchases that are so so necessary to the to the department. I'm hopeful that we can uh, replicate this allotment this coming year, so that we are constantly purchasing for uh, these vehicles. Will replace vehicles that are currently on the fleet, correct? Actually, ma'am, um, they're going to help us keep up with our hiring, to be honest with you. Um, I have um, officers right now that are driving vehicles that are extremely old. So, yes, we will, be, uh, we will be getting rid of some of our more older vehicles, maybe two of them. Uh -huh. But right now, we are at our, we are at our max in vehicles uh, for officers that we have on the department. Okay, that's awesome. So... Uh I have a motion and a second for a recommendation for to full council of consideration of approval of six vehicles for the Department of Safety. Uh, all in favor, what, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. So motion passes three to zero. It will be on the next agenda for uh, full council, Chief. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll leave you there. And does anybody mind if I just leave Chief there and and go to him first on the reports. Uh, I don't. I don't want you to go into too too much detail on your report because I realize that you want to get back to the Frito Pie dinner, but I do need to hear about any concerns, problems, issues, anything that your department is experiencing right now that that could that could be an issue that you want the governing body to know about. Actually, um, I'd, I'd like to start off with something good, and then if I could res uh, respond a little bit to. Uh, Councillor Salazar's uh, questions that he had that I documented. Um, just today, we've talked a lot about community outreach in my department. Um, as of today, I've reached out to three of our community members that we are commit in my department. These are all volunteers. We're creating a community policing committee. So I have uh, 
one community member who's lived in our city for two years is coming from California, an unbelievable resume in dealing with crime prevention, and she led the homeless task force in a city in California where she was from. So again, these are, these are volunteers that are gonna meet with me um, probably monthly in my office, and, and I'll tell you why, because I get, continue, I get a, countless numbers of phone numbers, of phone calls, and, and I need our community, I've asked for help in the community. Has <coughs> so I have somebody that's gonna do a crime prevention specialist, a homeless task force coordinator for me. I have a community outreach person who's gonna specifically only deal with neighborhood associations and is going to be the police contact for us. And, and again, she will be a volunteer. Our very own Bethany uh, Bratley back here is, has volunteered generously to meet with me. So I'd like to have at least five members of our community in the biggest areas that we have issues. And, and trust me, I have the information for them to go through, for them to parse through, and for us to together come up. And I think that's a better use. And, and I've asked for this, and they've responded. So um, I have the names, the phone numbers. We're, we're going to meet, actually, our first meeting will probably be next week to get ready to start in January, just full blown. And they're going to be my point of contact with the community to help me with that. I think the only other thing I'd like to talk about is um, we, we did talk about um, that Operation Sunshine that we conducted that started on April, 20, uh, that ended on April 23rd and started on October 26th. Um, we ended up a total uh, with a to grand total of 130 arrests. This was a joint effort with the Rio Riva Sheriff's Office and the New Mexico State Police. Um, I did want to respond a little bit to the, the, scene, the scene how crime is moving to the west side. Um, we, we've seen that, the officers are aware. Um, the mayor has requested that after a month, my administrative staff come up with new hotspots so we can see what's going on. I would love to share with all of you some of the investigations that we have going on. Um, hopefully by next month, um, I'm free to give you some insight into some of the investigations that we're doing. And I think um, you'll feel a lot better about the property crime that's going on, on up here in the west side. We have. Uh, those two property crime detectives are, have been unbelievable. Um, in my folder, I have four arrest warrants for property crime offenders. Um, we do have a significant investigation that I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we're gonna be able to disclose within the next week or so. And uh, there's a couple of other things that, that we are gonna share once we make the arrests. We'll share them through the, our local media and our Facebook. But, we are changing the direction of what we're doing, but yes, we are seeing more here on the west side. And um, I can tell you that now that I live here in Española, like all, all of us, I, I go to Walmart, I go to Lowe's, I go to CVS, you know, I go to Walgreens. You're right, there has been a very a downturn, but we do see more issues. And like I say, that's why I think a homeless coordinator for my department would help me to work with people, with Cynthia, um, and work with our, our community, but I need somebody that's going to be volunteering for my department that's going to be there for me. Other than that, um, like I said, we are probably three under my authorized strength. Um, unfortunately, five of those are uncertified, but we're continuing to move forward, and everybody is putting in their best effort to, to do the best we can. Both of my officers that were involved in that OIS are back at work. They've been cleared. They're ready to get back and serve our community. So it was good to see them come back in a right frame of mind, and, and I appreciated the, the way they came back. Uh, thank you, Chief. Have you considered at all, uh, I know that we had purchased more than one license plate reader at one time. I know that there was a, a purchase of other ones, and I thought, at, at, I heard at one time that we had up to 10. We do, ma'am, and we're waiting for, um, we're waiting for actually 10 more cameras with the, uh, with I, um, just like with my station, my police station, um, cameras are on back order until who knows when. Um, we're trying, the city manager and I met with the, the final vendor that we were gonna purchase them. We ordered them and um, we've been waiting for them and this is what I was gonna use this community, uh, my committee, to see where we were gonna put them and we were gonna use the hotspots. But yes, they're on order. I do currently have 10 ALPRs within our community and I'm um, looking to get 10 more cameras. Do you have jurisdictions where, where your staff is supposed to be in certain areas of our community or are they just, or they're just reactive to whatever calls come in? At this point in time, <laughs> we are, 
primarily reactive, but I, I can tell you that the other night um, I received a call from a community member in reference to a property crime, and uh, we went by, and it was pretty, it was very uh, positive interaction that we were able to, to make an arrest. But for the most part, we're reactive. Um, I think I've shown that throughout a month, we take anywhere from 18, 1,800 to 1,900 calls a month. Um, my staff, my officers are working 12-hour shifts. I'm hoping that at some point I can change them once I get enough people to four tens. That way I have a little more flexibility. I have overlap, and once I have overlap, I can have people that are on that overlap do other um, op plans, right, TAC plans. But right now, when one gets off, the other one comes on, and that's just the way it is for now. 12 on, 12 off is what I, is what I have with zero overlap. Um, I, I still feel like studying the um, studying the, the time of, of high peak times for crime and low peak times for crime and adjusting the schedule would probably probably help us with that too, but it's not my call. But I do believe that that's a, a way to utilize the officers that we have to the, to the fullest. Um, like like Ms. Lanchetti said, and like uh, Councilor Dennis mentioned, and, and myself, we, we all have seen what is happening on the west side. Uh, so I'm hopeful that we'll start to see more police presence on the west side and, uh, and that we have some serious uh, arrests very quickly on the things that have been happening, especially the robberies and such. It's, it's hard for a small business person to stay in business in Española and to get hit by something like that can just be detrimental. So we wanna solve this as soon as possible and to the fullest nature of the law and make sure that we can get an arrest and get people uh, who are offending in our community to be accountable. So thank you, sir, for, for your comments. Uh, is there anything else in your department beyond the new vehicles or anything else that you need to share with us? Um, no, ma'am, we're continuing our in-service training. Um, we're continuing to buy equipment, um, tasers, cartridges. We, we, we need to ensure that each of our officers, our new officers, is well equipped to perform their duty while they're, on, while they're out within our community. So probably training now is one of our keys that we're trying to just make sure we, we meet all state standards. Absolutely, and I feel like the more training that we can do for our staff, the better and safer everybody is. So I feel like that's very, very important. That's a key element to having a very good department is training and in-house training. So whatever we can do with that, I appreciate that. I thank you, sir, for your commitment to Española. I thank you for moving to Española. It shows a deeper level of commitment on your part. And uh, let's just uh, get some good solid arrests real soon, okay? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you guys. <coughs> uh, fire Chief and De Deputy Fire Chief John and John. <laughs> John and John. That's a new ice cream company yeah, John, name. John. <laughs> Madam Pro Tem, governing body. Uh, I'm going to try to make this as short as I can. So, like I say, uh, you've got a copy of my reports. Total calls that we bought, we're at 2,694 calls for the year. We're anticipating that we'll probably be hit close to 3,000 by the end of this year for the year. Is that high or low than normal or pretty normal? That's going to be our, one of our highest. 600 years. calls higher? Yeah. 600 higher. And, uh, just another little things that I want to, you know, tell you, bring up with you. Tomorrow we have a meeting with our city manager, a state fire marshal's office. We're trying, we're going to be working on and see where we're going to go with La, the building of La Jolla Station. And uh, we'll see where we go then. And probably by next meeting we'll be reporting, you know, where we're going to go and what's going to happen and stuff. And the other thing is, you know, we did meet with our state fire marshal. He did come up here and stuff, and he is... Uh, you know, wanting to support us of trying to see if we can get a training facility up here. And not only did that help us when he came up here and looked at our building and stuff, he saw where we had our trucks parked and stuff, where we have them inside our, that, what's it called? Armory. The armory. He did tell us, you know, that, well, how, how come we haven't applied for trying to make that into a substation? 
And we're like, wow, we know we never thought about that. We're gonna work on that. So if, if we can get that for a substation for next year, you know, we could be looking at getting our department at least another 60 to $100,000 in our ISO, you know, for our monies. I also wanted to, you know, tell you that I'm very proud of my staff. I have a heck of a staff. I am too. And I wanted to like to let you know that everything that we've done, it's not just been, you know, I don't, I don't take the credit for it because I let my staff do what needs to be done. John has worked diligently in everything to get a lot of stuff done for me. Uh, but I wanted to let, and one of the biggest things that I'm really proud of is you, you were there, Madam Pro Term. On November 15, we had our, my, uh, one of my uh, firemen graduate from the police academy and he was announced valedictorian of that of the class and that was like a big thing for me we're gonna we're i'm working with chief garcia here so you know we're going to see where we're going to put him or what we're going to do with him when, and use him when we need him i think we're we're in a really good predicament with uh pablo because of the double certifications and being able to utilize him not only for enforcement on the fire side, investigation on the fire side, but also uh, when needed with the PD also. So I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing that happened there and I'm really, really impressed with it and really excited about it. And, I, and the one thing that I could tell you is, you know, we, all my guys have worked hard and, and now you can see in my reports, all, we've been running all kinds of fires, dumpster fires, uh, brush fires and stuff, and you could see all the ones that the ones that I have reported to you, you have in front of you are just for two months. My guys have been out there running calls day and night every year. I mean, I'm really impressed with them and they do their job well. They do. Uh, I don't have anything else to say, but I'll yield the floor to my assistant if he has anything he wants to add. I think you, I think you covered it. Um, looking forward to the meeting tomorrow with the State Fire Marshal's office to talk about La Jolla. We're hoping that that goes well. We can move on with that that project. Um, uh, I think you, you covered it. Oh well, yeah, the only other thing that I did is John has all reached out to her because we have, like I tell you, my guys working when we give them an assignment, they do. We had my EMS coordinator, uh, Nick Mangas, that came up like with a contract that we want to see how we can, the hospital can help start helping us yeah. for transports and paying stuff like that. Well, so it's a little contract and we ran it through the, uh, city manager, he said it was okay, you know, send it off and see, because once they get it and they look at it, they, their legal team can start tearing it apart it and apart, seeing yeah. that. If that happens to go good, you know, we'll bring it back to you and, sh you know, just to keep up. Through. That's something that we definitely want to see. I think that that would really help the fire department. I'm hopeful that whatever funds come in will be reinvested into the fire department and hopefully look at building your department as we move forward. One of the things that I want to go back on, and I definitely would be remiss if I don't talk about it, is the, important of this, the importance of the training center and, and how critical that is, not only to the fire department and developing your own fire department, but it's critical to developing professional volunteer firefighters all around this community. And when you look at the community and you look at the volunteer sector of who is out there actually volunteering, you have La Mesilla, San Pedro, La Puebla, Corteles, uh, Hernandez, ABQ, Dixon, Velarde, Alcalde, all of these areas are, are, are fire fought with volunteers. And the volunteers cannot just take off of work and go take a week down in Socorro and go get trained. And that's the only training facility in the state of New Mexico at this time. So this, this northern New Mexico training facility thought is, it's just brilliant. It's something that needs to be had and it needs to be here in our community. And I, I just want you to know that I will do whatever it takes to make sure that that thing gets built. And I'm very, very serious about this. And that's I, like I say, right now, you know, we've talked to Randy Varela, who's the State Fire Marshal. He's, he's backing us up on all that and is supporting us. He's gonna help us to see what we can get. And like I tell you, it's a, it's a big jump for me, a big step for me. and you know, for my administration, for me, because like I say, it's not only, it's happened because I allow my people to do what they what they need to do and, and they want to do it. I don't hold them back. And and like I tell you, one, one of the biggest things that I've learned and, and 
and I worked with a lot of people, and I worked with John for a long time, and like I said, Ms. Hall, I, we had our issues in the beginning and stuff, but you know, we worked those out, and look where we're at right now, and everything has come along and stuff, and, and I'm not gonna be sit here and, and take the credit for everything, because I, it's, like I say, I believe in a, in team effort, and we've all done a team effort, and that's all I have to say. Like I, like I say, I'm proud of my department. I, I am too, and I have to tell you both uh, that you you sort of both are like the yin and yang in the fire department, and you you sort of work really really well together. And I'm so happy about that because it doesn't always happen. A lot of times, egos get in the way, and people are prideful, and it doesn't happen where people can can allow other people to do stuff and and not feel like they need to be in charge and supersede everything. Well, well I'll tell you one thing. I can say when I first started in the department and John here, you know, we had our dis differences and stuff. We had our little arguments and stuff. But, you know, but the next day we're still, we're still yeah. friends. You exactly. know what I mean? well, and, and at the end of the day, it's about you know what's what I mean? good we for never, the community. You know, Do you yeah, know what I mean? I've never taken it to uh, yeah. taken it of him. He's never taken anything like that. But, you know, yeah. we work together. and It's awesome. And, and like I said, I'm very, very... Uh, very, very interested in forwarding this effort for for the vision for that training center. I feel so like just, so. Just this year, we do have seven hundred thousand that we can reallocate to that ICIP number um, to get this project started. That doesn't include the mo the money for for La Jolla, correct? No, that's the three million that we want to rebuild La Jolla with, and the three million we're thinking that came in at one point five. So once that project's completed, we can reallocate that money at that time, which will probably be next year. So we'll have 700,000 to start this year. We'll reallocate it now in this session. It'll be available, available probably July is when they make those funds available to us. We can start it when we get the 1.5, the rest of the money for La Jolla, we can reallocate that next year to help with that. We looked into training facilities. They're about a million, so I think we, we can do it, um, and then I think we can have a little bit to, to build a substation as well up there so we can get some funding. For that was gonna be my question because I thought the La Jolla project was ready to go. It is ready to go. Sure. We can do that. That's what we have a meeting tomorrow with, with okay. CM. That project is ready to go. We can start demolition this week. Um, I have a contractor, he gave us the numbers. He's, he's ready to go. We did an asbestos test on it. It came back, that building is full of asbestos. So I did get the abatement um, a proposal. It came in at about 67,000. We have the money to do it. We have the three million. So I'm saying let's, let's just get that project completed. You know, let's, let's demolition, get La Jolla rebuilt, have a brand new station for the guys and, and ladies um, and take care of that project and then move on to the, to the armory which I, I, we have money to start that as well. So I think we can do both simultaneously and we're gonna be golden. Understand, that's good, that's good. Uh, thank you guys for your presentation and thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for preparing the, the packet. Uh, just keep doing what we do and stay safe out there, guys. Thank you, Thank you guys. Uh, do we have George uh, Madrid online? Hey, I'm so yes, ma'am, I'm here. I'm so sorry I have not recognized you until right now. Oh my God. It's okay. It's okay. I was just hindering in the wind. But it's a, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm so sorry. I would, go ahead. We were actually, go ahead, actually, Your Honor. It worked, it worked out really good because we were working on the light freight float. So oh, I've been, I was I was listening in and everybody's listening and I just got home. Okay, so it good. worked out perfect. Um, I don't really have much to add to say. I do want to highlight the fire department though. Um, a couple weeks ago, I walked out my front porch and everything was lit up. And my neighbor across from me, she's lived alone. So I got a little worried. I walked over. I ended up seeing her. So I walked up to her and I was talking to her on the side of the fence. And her friend um, ended up 
not sure what happened, but she was unresponsive. But I want to highlight the fire department because those boys that were on that team, they were working and they had such good teamwork. And I was really impressed. They did everything they possibly could. And they were out there for over an hour. I mean, they worked. Unfortunately, she didn't make it, but I, w I was very, very, very proud of the fire department. Thank you for mentioning that. I I've seen the younger, uh, the younger employees of the fire department, and I, I get so, so excited for our future as a community and for them because they love what they're doing, man. They love that job, and they're just they're happy to be out there doing that. And I, I think that's so awesome. So thank you for, for, for saying that publicly, Judge. Yeah, you're very welcome, Mom. I was, I was just impressed with them. Thank you. I really was. Um, as far as the court, really don't have much to report. I just want to throw for last month, we only had 67 citations. Um, that, that, that was just, that was it for the month. We're at 258 for this fiscal year. Um, we, on December 23rd, we're having our annual luncheon. I will be sending out the invites on Monday to everybody. So I'm hoping everybody can come on in. I'm inviting it's If many people want to come, they are invited to come. December 23rd, 8.30 to 11, the Espanol Municipal Court. Thank you for that invitation. We'll definitely be there. Uh, uh -huh. I, I wanted to touch base on this, on the graffiti. It seems like there's been a little bit of an uptick on graffiti in our community, yes or no? Yes, there is, but there is a reason. Okay. Now, uh, now during winter, uh -huh. it is. Now that it, if it's under 50 degrees, uh -huh. we, can't, we can't go out and paint. Oh. If we go and paint, the paint will just crack right off. It has okay. to be over 50 degrees for at least 10 hours. So we've been trying to catch the good days to get out there and do it. It just there, there hasn't been very much. So, so just as a matter of question, these guys that are doing the graffiti don't know about that 50 degree rule then, right? I, I doubt they're listening right now, so I don't think they know about that rule. Darn. Are any of them artists <laughs> that they could make them look nicer? Maybe we I, need honestly, to put some nice artwork. <laughs> honestly, and I've been, I've been thinking about that because um, the Jordan that's at the, on Lucero Center, that thing has stayed intact. There was one time that it's been vandalized and the artist came back and he fixed it. Um, I would love to start doing more stuff like that in the community on our something art, something spiritual, something appealing, something positive. I know that. And there's a lot of we have that a lot of does happen in, in other communities with the dumpsters. And that's something that I know that graffiti artists respect other people's art. Uh -huh. So that's something yes. that we should definitely look at. Um, yeah, just give, forward. Give, them, give them something constructive to put it on and make it nice. Maybe then we'll have a little bit less. I mean, even here at Ranchitos, if we got like a good, it would be really, um, how do I say, Ranchitos is a high hit area. So we'd be taking a big chance to put something nice there, but it's worth the gamble in my eyes. Maybe if we put something nice on this dugout and or we did how the um, city has the plan to redo the park, it's as much as the court can help, I would love to, any part of the city. You know, Anything Judge, that, we can do. that happened at my old employer in, in our back parking lot. There was walls pretty much on every side. And so we put together a little committee and we made it a project and we put it out there to uh, mainly the teens of the community, right? That were actually, they were actually doing the graffiti, but they admitted it and came over, right? And mm -hmm. they painted those walls. You should see them. They come uh, every year, actually. Uh, the, my old employer got funding for them. And there's people that come from other countries just to see the artwork on those walls. If, you, if you're ever in Santa Fe, go by there. It's, uh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's beautiful artwork. Well, we look at all the good artwork, the one that um, is on Yonate. Yeah, um, but on the talent. old theater that it hasn't been touched like they're they are respecting the good art so if we get the supplies we can get the money for it we there's so much talent in this community our youth and just there's so much artists and talent that we could really make something nice i i agree um it's very important and i look forward to warmer weather where we can paint some of that uh, not so appealing stuff up 
I agree. I agree. Um, I've been pushing. I've been every. I've been asking my group of guys, sir, what's the weather? What temperature is it today? What temperature? I've been trying to get him out there, but today was nice. But I don't think it was over fifty for ten hours. <laughs> maybe if you were in the sun all all day, maybe, but maybe not. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then it just it just starts to peel off, and it it, it doesn't it you it just peels right off of it. Can you give me an update on the programming that we purchased right when you came in, Judge? As what? of right now, uh -huh. um, the programming we, um, Tyler Technology, it was not for us, for our staff. I mean, everybody, it was just the way that the setup was, the, the conversion was the problem. Mm -hmm. The way that they converted it. They couldn't convert um, a lot of money. There was fines that had been paid that said it wasn't, and they wanted to us to override the system and say just write it off all this money, write it off. And I wasn't about to let that happen, so we ended up getting out of it. Um, we're still on Sleuth, but you know what? We've mastered Sleuth. I learned that like the back of my hand. Jolene, my court administrator, knows it extremely well all my staff knows really well and it works for us is it up you, to date no you, but it it works great so, so my concern is it, it's not in danger of crashing no um no um sleuth we still have um we already paid the annual maintenance we didn't pay it at, uh, at the beginning because we were going to tyler but we um reached out to leslie webb, webb who is still our our contact and he's the one that fixes anything if we have problems mm -hmm. and we're, we're still good okay uh how, how much money was saved by not purchasing that tyler oh uh, i want to say about thirty six thousand. i would say i would say something like that i would say about 37 i think it was 37 8. okay it, that we didn't there um i'll be honest there are still pending um invoices but we emailed the city manager, wrote a letter. He sent it to Tyler saying that we could not afford this The um, according to the whole policy. He cited everything. And we have not heard a word from them. Okay. We didn't heard anything. Um, Jolene emailed our person that was doing all of our setup and everything and said that we had sent the letter, what it was about. No response. We haven't heard a word. So, so do you know um, for sure but, that they have an invoice the city? Um, although we have a couple pending where um, me and the city manager have been in touch and we're kind of, we're waiting for for them to reply. We've sent sent them to reply. They haven't asked for for any of the pending invoices. And there's all there. I believe there's only three of them. All right. But I can't I don't, I don't have them out on my on hand. OK, uh, thank you for your time, Judge. We look forward to visiting with you and your department. Uh, on December 23rd. I also wanted to personally thank you for swearing in the new officers for Chief Misel and for the public safety uh, sector, Pablo and everybody else that got sworn in. We welcome those new officers. We pray over everyone's safety uh, that works for our community. And we try to provide you with the safest environment as, as we can. Uh, the swearing in ceremonies that you did at the chambers were very nice. The chambers is looking very festive and very nice. So we appreciate your staff and everything they're doing over there. And I thank you, Judge, for what you're doing for our community, okay? Thank you very much. I appreciate everything. And Mayor uh, Mayor Pro Temp, you are welcome. Any of the council members, you guys are welcome in my office at any, at any time. You want to come in and see court. You want to come in and sit in on a team court. You want to come and have coffee. You guys are welcome at any time. You're awesome. Thank you so much. We appreciate the invitation. You're very you welcome. Dennis. You guys have a blessed night. Uh -huh. uh, Councilor Dennis, do you have anything that you need to add? Um, no, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. I don't have anything else to add at this time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councilor Denise, anything? Uh, nothing at this time. Okay, with that being said, uh, our next uh, meeting is tentatively for January 4th. I know the staff comes back on January 3rd. I'm not sure that it's fair to to uh, make you guys come to a meeting because of the advertisement of the 72 hours. That would mean that somebody would have to come in during their time off to advertise that meeting. So I feel like it's important important to have the meeting, but we could 
do one of two things. Uh, we could either postpone it for a later time in the month to, to give the staff more time, or we could uh, just skip over it and head to the February meeting, whatever is the pleasure of the committee members. Uh, I'm okay either way, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I don't know if Chief thinks he'll have a lot of updates or um, Chief Martinez, a lot of updates. Maybe we can just skip January and go into February. Can we I, I think the thing that's hard on, especially on you, yeah. because you're off with your family and stuff, right. and then expecting that 72 hour uh, advertisement and expecting you guys to have the packet material ready. Right. It's really not fair if you guys are on, on break, so I really don't want to do that to the staff. So for right now, what we can do is, uh, Dennis, do you, do you have any uh, preference? Um, I actually, I do agree with uh, Councilor Benavides. maybe just look to, you know, I'm good with either or, but possibly even just look to February, unless something very pertinent comes up where we would have to do something sometime in, in the month of January, but not necessarily the the third, but yeah, we, we could do it possibly uh, February if um, you all are in agreement with that. What what day would that be? February 1st? Uh, I, I think that's okay. We, we can go to February 1st. In the meantime, if you have a concern or a question for any of the departments, if you would just please email them stuff. If you need information, feel free to reach out to any of these guys. These guys will be happy to answer an email, correct guys? or answer a question from any committee members that you need, okay? Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, each and every one of you has a safe and happy holiday season. And uh, we have one more meeting for the council coming up here next week. And then, and then we'll be on real break. So uh, I know the fire department and the police department, your schedule is a little bit altered compared to the rest of us. And we appreciate that too, because we could not function without you guys being there to serve us. Uh, sir, we wish you the very best in our community. I'm hopeful that your voucher has been fixed and you're uh, currently looking for for something and that something opens up very quickly for you and that there's uh, blessings beyond what you could have imagined coming from this community. And if there are needs that need to be met, I'm sure if you discuss with Councilor Denise, this council has a big heart and they will do whatever they can to help you, okay? Thank you. And thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Samantha, for everything you do for our community. And thank you, ladies, especially for what you're doing. Uh, we could not do this without you, that's for sure. Thank you, guys. Have a nice evening. This meeting is adjourned. Recording stopped. Me too.